Great. So welcome to uh, a focus today on powdery mildew. I'm Melissa Hansen, the Research Program Director for the Washington State Wine Commission. Uh, the Wine Commission and Washington State University, we partner together and put uh, these WAVE or WAVE Xs together. Um, they, uh, WAVE stands for Washington Advancements in Viticulture and Enology, and they're designed to really drill down to the research results and help bring make that connection between the research and the industry. And uh, we like to do these in person. Uh, hopefully next year we will be, because then it also gives industry growers and winemakers a chance to visit and get to know their researchers. Um, but one of the great things about Zoom is that we can bring in somebody from out of state. And so I'm really thrilled today to be able to uh, feature Dr. Michelle Moyer and Dr. David Gowry from Cornell University. I'm gonna introduce both of them now and then uh, Michelle will be first and then she'll hand it over to David. Um, and first, some real quick little housekeeping. You guys probably have this memorized by now. Mm -hmm. um, but just a as a reminder, put your question and answers in the Q&A. Don't put them in chat box because everybody can't see the chat box. And we will be recording this and all those who registered will get a link and the White Commission will also have the recording link on our website and it'll be um, publicized in our newsletters. Uh, and then just a, pl a plug, the next uh, short little focused webinar is July 14th. Uh, we save the summer months for more of the wine focus, winemaking focused uh, research because growers are off uh, quite busy. Uh, so it will be working with high pH wines. Dr. Thomas uh, Hinnett Kling just finished up some uh, research on uh, how to work with high pH wines and keep them uh, keep the wine spoilage out of them. So you can go to the Wine Commission's web website to register. Um, and then just our, our little plug here. So with that, I'm going to uh, stop sharing. And as I stop, so uh, Michelle, if you want to start to pull yours up. Um, Michelle uh, got her BS from the University of Wisconsin, and then she went to Cornell to get her PhD in plant pathology and studied underneath uh, Dr. David Godowry. So we have a nice little connection here. Michelle's the Associate Professor of and Extension Viticulturist, and she uh, leads a national uh, research project on powdery mildew and fungicide resistance. And she's going to bring us up to date on frame. Uh, fungus, she can, she'll, you'll see that uh, spelled out here in her slides. Um, and she also spends quite a bit of time on nematodes and phylloxera. So with that, Michelle. Sorry, I'm sorry here. We're having a, I'm having a little bit of a challenge. Let me know if you actually can see my screen. I did stop sharing. I'm gonna try again. There we go. It's just being silly. That's it's all me, Melissa. It's not you. Trust okay. me. <laughs> Can you see my screen? Yes. All right. Perfect. Thanks to you, everybody. So I am very excited here today to actually be able to present with with David um, about various things, all related to to great powdery mildew. So I did have the, the wonderful opportunity and chance to work with David for about five six years back in the early two thousands, and so it's fun to kind of come full circle. Um, so today I'm going to have just a little, little bit of a preamble. Most of the today's show is dedicated to what David will be presenting on UVC light and, and grapevines, but I wanted to give uh, folks who are attending a chance to have a quick update on what our program is doing related to fungicide resistance management. And then of course, um, what we are doing to help assist David with field trials and evaluations related to managing powdery mildew in grapes using um, UVC light. So quick, um, obviously everybody knows I like to do fun plugs and the big thing related to powdery mildew, obviously our, our main uh, management strategy is still uh, pesticide-based or fungicide-based applications or sprays. For those who do not already know, uh, FRAC, you guys should, should know what the word FRAC is. You've probably heard me say it way too many times, but the, the FRAC organization has developed a really nice uh, smartphone application that you can download that allows you to search by fungicide branding or fungicide active ingredients. And it provides all the information that you would need to know on the resistance of that particular FRAC group, 
cross resistance within that BRAC group, et cetera. So it's a really nice supplementary um, tool to have when you guys are writing your spray programs or evaluating your spray programs that you're receiving from another person. So that's my quick plug. So visit BRAC.info to uh, download that application. Um, I, I use it quite a bit. It's, it's a pretty nice, um, very intuitive app. So really the, the point of the, the work that my program is, is currently focusing on, and obviously the discussions that we'll be kind of um, touching on today relates to product stewardship, really. So how, how do we think about the future of disease management when we start to lose tools? And, and that's what fungicide resistance is, right? It's, it's the loss of potential efficacious tools that, um, for, for field application. So the work that we're doing on is, is looking at that as one, how do we keep products on the useful and um, in our tool toolbox for a longer period of time. And then what do we do when we inevitably lose those products for, for various reasons? So first a quick update on FRAME. So as Melissa mentioned, that's a large federal project I'm leading called, uh, it's titled Fungicide Resistance Assessment Mitigation and Extension Network for Wine Table and Raisin Grapes. And really the premise of that particular project is, is monitoring for um, fungicide resistance and grapevine powdery mildew, and then hopefully working out some strategies to help improve spray program design to reduce field level control failures related to fungicide resistance. The primary focus is on looking for FRAC 11 or the strobiliarin resistance um, in, in grape powdery mildew, but we are also working on FRAC 3 resistance monitoring, FRAC 7 resistance monitoring, 13, et cetera. So we're build, trying to build tools for those. But most of you are familiar with our with our rapid testing, so I wanted to provide a quick update on what we've seen so far. So, with the Wine Commission and with um, this frame frame federal SCRI project, we've been monitoring fungicide resistance in Washington State since 2017. And so, what you're seeing here in these pie charts are the percent of the, the samples that you all have submitted to my program for evaluation that have come back resistant in red. Um, uh, sensitive to FRAC 11 fungicides in green, and then kind of a mixed population where there were some resistant isolates and some, um, or individuals and some um, um, sensitive individuals. So back in 2017, we got a lot of samples from you guys. I think 2016, 2017 were kind of the early years of some potential field level failures with mildew. So a lot of samples were sent in, we had about 250, and most of them all came back as, or most of them came back as resistant to FRAC 11 fungicides, so obviously um, pretty concerning. Our sample size has gone down over the years, and part of that's because you guys have been excellent at mildew control. I think we really hit things hard between 2017 and 2018, and that, that is, we are seeing the results of that. So the big take home here that I wanted to, to emphasize is the number of samples that we are getting back right now that are resistant to FRAC 11 fungicides is going down. So the proportion of those are, are going down, which is a really nice positive sign that we're either doing a much better job controlling mildew period. So we're just not detecting mildew in vineyards or that you guys have also done such a good job switching up, pulling FRAC 11 fungicides out of your program, we're only using them once or only using them with tank mixes that we're really starting to see that proportion go down. And we also know you have responded to some of our um, pleas to, to to back off in the FRAC 11s because since at least over a two to three year growing season period, we've seen a decrease in FRAC 3 and FRAC 11 use within our state in terms of number of applications. But what concern, and obviously subsequent uptick of sulfur use, so clearly folks are, are tank mixing. But what we have seen is instead of using FRAC 3 and FRAC 11 fungicides, um, you guys are switching to FRAC 7 um, FRAC 50, so that's Vivando and Prolevo, and FRAC U06, which is um, Torino, you're starting, we're starting to see an, an uptick in the number of those applications. And especially in 2019 and 2020, we're really starting to see jumps of, of folks just not using FRAC 11s or 3s at all, and then really heavily relying on the FRAC 50 and the FRAC U06. So I just, I do want folks to be be conscious. If you are using things like Prolevo, Vivando, and Torino in your vineyard, they're excellent products don't use them more than twice in season. In fact, you can just use them once, uh, each one of those product or FRAC 50 once, a FRAC 6 once. That's really what we would like to see happen because these are pro 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 uh, products that have um, seen fungicide resistance in, in the European Union area. So th there is the risk there. So just be careful. Um, they're great products, but <laughs> when we overuse, when we switch for overuse of one thing to another, it's still an overuse. Um, the other thing we've learned in over the course of frame or this frame project is that 
we very rarely detect um, FRAC 11 resistant isolates early in the growing season. And in many cases, it's actually very hard to detect mildew in the field in a normal commercial setting, uh, much before pre-bloom and bloom. We usually, um, when we find sensitive isolates, so we usually pick them up at post fruit set to bunch closure. But by the end of the growing season is when we really start to see a lot of FRAC 11 um, resistant isolates. We're not necessarily entirely sure why, why this might be the case. There might be some fitness costs or advantage that, that allows selection for those resistant individuals to thrive towards the end of the season. It could also very much be related to the fact that a number of the betridicides that I think a lot of us like to use out here in, this, in, in Washington tend to have a FRAC11 product in it. So we're selecting, we're increasing the population of resistant isolates that would have already been in the vineyard, perhaps kind of developing around here um, at this time. But the key take home is you guys are doing great and rotating things up and we're starting to see a reduction in the number of uh, FRAC11 resistant isolates. So that's, that's a, a positive thing. So with that, if you're like, but Michelle, I never sent you a sample and I would love to have free testing before WC starts charging you for it. I say, excellent, send me an email or actually send my, my project manager, Charlotte Oliver, an email and we can actually ship out some um, sample um, sampling kits to you. It's a, it's a quick glo glove and swab method. I think many of you guys are familiar with shoving swabs up your nose at this point. It's the same thing. You use the same tool as if you rub it on a leaf surface. So much, much less invasive than, than a COVID test. So you just send that back to us. And if we receive samples by a Monday, you'll get your results by a Friday. So it's a really quick um, turnaround. Um, and the beauty of this potential um, technique, we have more information if, if you are interested, is some folks are actually using it for presence and absence sampling. So we can actually use it to detect the presence of mildew in addition to detecting the presence of um, FRAC 11 resistant um, isolates. We've also run a bunch of numbers and have come to the conclusion that from a commercial standpoint, there are some labs that do offer FRAC 11 fungicide resistance testing commercially. What will likely happen at the end of frame when these, because it's a very simple test to do, but it's not cheap. Um, the, like will, the likely cost of these things will be about 50 to $75 a unit, depending on where you're located, because there is, there is some cost savings with doing large sampling. So just so everybody's aware, but until 2022, Two of August, you can get it, your samples tested for free. So I would recommend doing that. So again, Charlotte Oliver's email address is right here. I'll actually put that same email address in the chat box when we are done so you guys can access and email Charlotte. And again, these are for um, folks who are in Washington. If you're elsewhere in the country, just let Charlotte know and she can connect you with a, another person within the United States that can provide a sampling kit for you that's closer to your area. Again, I uh, do want to direct folks to our frame website. We have lots of resources and information there. Um, just kind of an overview of what you can see. It's at framenetworks.wsu.edu. And most importantly, when you guys are sending us in your um, fungicide swabs, we'll actually send you back a decision tree that will tell you how to adjust your spray programs to, depending on what the results are of your testing that, that's coming back. So if you have sensitive isolates early season versus resistant isolates, how might you be able to adjust your program if you are if you have FRAC 11 fungicides that are in your current rotation, how uh, might you better be able to use them? So this is a, a new tool that you guys can download from our frame um, website at this time. We also, keeping on the my uh, bad COVID joke theme, um, have a FRAC 11 resistance dashboard. So this is modeled off of the John, Johns Hopkins dashboard. And um, we will be updating this annual or updating this throughout the 2021 growing season, but you can access it from our website and you can actually see um, <laughs> which states have what levels or proportion of resistance in their, in their mildew isolates. And we also can do it uh, across grape type, uh, wine grapes, juice grapes, um, hybrid wine grapes, vinifera wine grapes. So it's kind of fun to, to poke around for those who really like to, to look and to monitor um, data. So that's available from the frame network as well. So into the important and fun parts so we can get David on the on screen. Um, the other thing that we like to do, so obviously fungicides are heavily used for mildew management, but clearly resistance is a challenge. So what are some alternative approaches that we can do to manage mildew that is not uh, necessarily direct chemistry, well, it's chemistry, but not necessarily a direct spray application in the traditional sense. So our, our program in conjunction with several other folks here at WSU, many of you are familiar with Law of Coat and Gwen Holheisel, we are the sprayer team. And we've been working on a number of alternative pest management projects uh, across tree fruit and grapes. Lexi McDaniel, picture here is the, the, our PhD candidate working on the grape systems. 
And so we're working on a series of machines that are considered no residue spray programs for, for tree fruit and grapes, including a heated oil or oil thermal therapy using field evaluations of, of ozonated water. Um, they don't work very well so far, but we're, we're working on that. And then of course, UVC therapy. So we're re using the term therapy because I don't like, we, we're calling them sprays and obviously they're not sprays, but yeah, UVC therapy. Lexi started our UVC trials last summer, um, working on essentially two major things. And I think David will talk, go into more of the details of how UVC works, but because that's all been worked out or is in the process of being worked out. But our main goal here through the Washington State Wine Commission was to work on uh, timing, just like with, with our fungicides, when can we use UVC to its, its best ability in our systems, and then intervals. So how frequently would we have to do UVC therapy treatments to uh, achieve some or totally commercially acceptable levels of disease control? So we, we did these two types of trials, um, working on trial one, where we're just uh, replacing early season sprays um, with UVC therapy. And then we did another trial where we did UVC therapy all season long, looking at seven day intervals and 14 day intervals. Um, unfortunately, it was a very low disease pressure uh, situation in our vineyard last year. Um, even looking at foliar disease, um, our canopies at most hit about uh, between 17 and 50% and, and of foliar severity. So um, is relatively high but even our grower controls had relatively high um, um, mildew uh, in the canopy because I don't treat the canopy. I don't treat our, I don't design our grower control sprays to manage foliar, we manage the fruit. And if you look at our fruit disease and David will probably cry a little bit on, on what untreated controls look like in terms of total disease severity here, between 0.6 and 4.8% cluster severity. So extremely low disease severity, but even with that very, very low disease pressure, which often makes it very hard to distinguish um, how treatments are, are going, we saw some really nice trends where a seven day UVC interval was giving us pretty acceptable levels of control. It wasn't quite as good as our total season long spray grower control, but they were performing better than our unsprayed control. So we, we saw that, liked that type of data um, and our, then have switched our treatments for this, this coming season to be reflective of some, some tighter intervals. We are also looking quite a bit at fruit quality. So we are measuring tannins, phenolics, and in basic harvest metrics for the fruit. Um, just because we are interested in seeing, and this is on Chardonnay, if, if the UVC, especially season long treatments have a, a potential negative impact on, on, on fruit quality. Uh, in addition, Lexi is monitoring these sites because I do have, just, just like the rest of you, I have uh, FRAC 11 fungicide resistant populations in this particular block. And we are monitoring to see how UVC, how UVC continuous treatment is, is affecting that population. We're still working on the data from that because we had some, some lab restrictions due to COVID that slowed down that data processing. So for this summer, um, we are continuing our UVC trials. We have a brand new unit that Lexi um, has worked with Vine Tech equipment to help us build out. It's on a three-point hitch, beautiful, beautifully easy to mount and easy to drive. So I know Lexi has appreciated that. Um, and kind of continuing both our interval and timing type trials. So looking at using UVC as a replacement for kind of our pre-bloom sulfur sprays and then switching to grower controls for the rest of the season. And then looking at um, a, a tighter interval schedule for more effective disease control. So comparing a twice a week UVC application to a once a week UVC application and relative to an untreated control in our conventional spray control. I am including the dose that we're doing down here, which is just 200 joules per meter squared, because um, David will discuss kind of some of their trials related to how much UVC you need. So this is just a number for folks to know that we are, we are evaluating a higher dose in our particular trial. And again, we'll be monitoring foliar and fruit disease progress um, throughout the whole season and doing kind of an end of the season um, rating as well. We are continuing to monitor effect on fungicide resistant population. And then Lexi is also expanding that kind of fruit quality data to potentially incorporate an effect on fruit sensory. So does, if we can't chemically measure changes in the fruit composition, is there a sensorial or a sensory shift that might impact um, picking decisions or, or how folks might want to use that fruit um, further on in, in wine processing? But I didn't want to take up too much time because we, everybody is here to listen to David and hear all the great things that he has done leading up to the UVC trial. But I just wanted to let folks know that we are taking the tools that David has developed out at Cornell and doing some field application here too, to see how we might be able to get them to fit within the, um, 
the Washington State wine grape production system because our weather is a little bit different than, than New York, upstate New York. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. There's one quick question. Yep. Um, would you want samples from a no pesticide vineyard? Absolutely, yep. Okay, great. So Paul, send them in. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, uh, in my excitement, I didn't give you a little background on David. Um, he's an East Coast guy, uh, went to, uh, graduated from New Hampshire in plant pathology. He's been at Cornell since 1985, uh, working on fruit diseases, powdery mildew, downy uh, mildew. And uh, he'll give you the, the full scale of his UVC, but this is one of those things that he worked on about 20 years ago, put it aside, and then it came back to life recently. So uh, sometimes things aren't ripe at the time, but they can uh, get better in the bottle. And I think maybe this, hopefully, this is one of those things that got better in the bottle with uh, a different look and different approach. So with that, David, uh, why don't you pull your screen up? Yeah. Let's see if I can still remember how to do screen sharing. Start this first. And then share screen. Is this working? Perfect. Good. You're up. All right, that's a load off my mind. <laughs> if we, you don't know this, but we showed up 45 minutes early, mostly because they were worried. I was worried about my ability to manage screen sharing. You would think that after 14 months of living on Zoom, I would, I would be able to do this. It's not true. So uh, thank you for having enough confidence in me to take a chance on me actually being able to talk to you. So thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, I want to talk to you about where we are in the research on the uses of light to suppress plant diseases in general. Now, some of you might have heard about this work on grapes and other crops. Uh, it's been in the news a lot lately, uh, especially on strawberries. What you might not have seen is the overall scope of the project, which involves uh, test sites on diverse crops around the US and, and as well as overseas. This is a big project. Uh, my job is really to function as the, the kind of the chief cat herder uh, for a team of scientists that spread across several institutions, uh, countries, and corporations. So much of what I'm going to be presenting today is actually uh, work that was conducted by other members of the research team, uh, both in the U.S. and overseas. As the, you know, as the project coordinator, uh, if you're interested in the peer-reviewed papers in the area, popular articles, the posters, contact information for the various investigators, uh, videos, educational resources, visits to some of the training sites when that becomes possible, uh, collaborative opportunities if you're interested in taking part in the trials. I'm happy to provide that information, so please contact me. So I want to start by trying to put this work in perspective. Now, microbial pathogens have been attacking plants for a very long time. They have a huge head start on, on humans. They've become pathogens over an evolutionary scale of time amidst endlessly repeated cycles of light and darkness. Now, in this time, these simple one-celled microorganisms have evolved to the point where they can sense, they can interpret, and they can use light to direct their development. Now, the, the general area of light and plant pathogens is really broad. There's a lot of people working in that area. I'm going to today take just one of those evolutionary traits, and we'll see how we can use it against a pathogen. And that one trait is how they deal with ultraviolet light. Now, above ground pathogens live in a world that's bathed in sunlight during daylight hours. Ultraviolet light is a natural part of the solar spectrum and it causes damage to a pathogen's DNA. Now, despite the occurrence of that damage, pathogens can survive and thrive in natural solar UV because they possess systems that can repair the damage to that DNA at almost as fast as it occurs. Those DNA repair systems are actually driven and recharged by blue light, so they don't operate during darkness. 
And that one simple fact is the key to using UV uh, successfully to suppress a pathogen. Now, a real breakthrough occurred in the work about 10 years ago when a PhD student named Rupalai Suthparan, uh, we were working with him in Norway on the research team there, discovered that applying UV light at night was much more effective in killing powdery mildew on cucumbers uh, than it was during daylight. In effect, applying UV at night bypasses the pathogen's ability to repair the damage to its DNA. That discovery alone allowed us to use about 10% of the dose of UV that would be required during daylight to achieve the same degree of disease reduction. So we now know that nighttime UV applications are similarly more effective against many pathogens and at a dose uh, far below what would cause damage uh, to the plant. Now, you can read about this uh, biochemical and genetic aspect of this phenomenon in excruciating detail. Uh, the bottom line for practical purposes is that pathogens such as powdery mildew, which is shown here, uh, and many other organisms just really don't like UV at night. And that means we can kill them with a fraction of the dose that's required during daylight. Our initial trials targeted various powdery mildews uh, because they're easy targets. They're on the outside of the plant. That makes them especially vulnerable to UV. Uh, but we've since found ways to use UV against other diseases and also insect pests. So I wanna go back uh, for a moment to the early 1990s, because I think this is a fitting example of uh, just how far we've come in this research area. This is a tractor drawn array of UVC lamps uh, that our lab used in 1991 to suppress powdery mildew on grapevines. The UVC uh, treatments were, were quite effective. Uh, they also defoliated the vines and made the grapes look a little bit like small russeted uh, potatoes. Uh, to put it mildly, that wasn't the success that we were aiming for. Fast forward a mere 30 years and we're presently on the threshold of an entirely new approach to controlling plant diseases. Now we got there only because we have a much better understanding of the pathogen biology, uh, pathogen ecology, and because of the pooled uh, engineering and physics and manufacturing and photobiology expert of the project team. The discovery of enhanced efficacy of nighttime UV was one part of that, uh, but there were a number of other refinements as well. Uh, strawberries are the crop where we worked out most of the bugs in the system. So I'll spend a little bit of time on strawberries uh, before we move on to grapes. Uh, this picture shows the basic array that we developed uh, for the UV lamps that we uh, designed in 2016 uh, for the first large-scale trials on uh, strawberries. Over each row, uh, there's a hemi-cylindrical array of 20 UVC lamps that are backed by polished aluminum reflectors. That densely packed array of lamps and reflectors uh, provides a large number of reflectance angles. So dose of UV throughout that three-dimensional space under the array is very uniform, irrespective of the distance of a plant surface of, to the nearest lamp. Now those multiple reflectance angles also mean there's improved coverage of the uh, undersurfaces of many of the leaves and fruit. Now this unit was operated at a, a commercial strawberry farm in 2017. The UV dose that we used was 85 joules per square meter. Now, joules is a, a, a unit of measurement that's not familiar to a lot of people. It's just watts over time. So if you think of a 50 watt bulb putting out a certain amount of energy, if it's putting out a total of 50 watts, so you're getting 50 watts per square meter, for example, if you get 50 watts per square meter for one second, that's 50 joules. Do it for four seconds, it's 200 joules. In this case, the dose was 85 joules per square meter and the applications were made once a week, starting one hour after sunset. A tractor speed we used was just about three miles per hour. So this is a short video showing what it looks like underneath the unit during one of the nighttime applications. You can see the hemi-cylindrical uh, banks of UVC lamps and the reflectors that are over each row of plants. 
The power for the lamps was supplied by a uh, small generator. Now, this was a unit that we designed, but it was entirely built and operated by the farm crew uh, at the research site. Now, the treatments worked very well. In fact, the dose of UV that was provided uh, suppressed powdery mildew across the duration of the experiment uh, that was substantially better than that was than that was that was provided by the best fungicide treatment in the trial, which was a combination of Quintec and Torino. We also confirmed that the UV treatments did not reduce uh, plant size for strawberry or reduce the yield of the harvested berries. Now, this is a video of what we called the Dragon 2.0. This is a tractor drawn unit in operation at a place called Fancy Farms in uh, Plant City, Florida. It looks a little bit less like a runaway tool shed, like the first version. Uh, so you can see we're getting closer to a commercial production unit. We now have a large enough footprint in multiple crops that we've actually attracted the attention of equipment manufacturers. Uh, that was our intent. As a research group, we really wanna get out of the business of building machines and get back to the business of, of discovery. That's, that's really what we do best. So we've repeated and expanded the strawberry trials in Florida and elsewhere in North America and in Europe. Now, some of the most intense interest in the UV technology actually comes from the strawberry nursery uh, operations. They're under tremendous pressure to reduce fungicide use because they need to uh, reduce the distribution of plants that harbor pathogens that are pre-selected for high levels of fungicide resistance and then get planted out in fruit production fields. And so we're collaborating with some of the larger nursery operations for strawberries on, on both coasts of North America. So this is the largest unit we've uh, designed to date and it's presently being used uh, at Keddie Nurseries uh, near Kentville, Nova Scotia. It has 90 uh, UV lamps arrayed in three separate eight foot long arrays and each one of those covers a five foot wide bed of uh, nursery plants and it can move up to five miles per hour. Uh, this is the one we call smog uh, after the fire breathing dragon uh, from Lord of the Rings, if you're a fan of that. In addition to these uh, tractor drawn units, there are fully autonomous uh, robotic carriages uh, that can move UV lamp arrays in either field settings or in high tunnels. Uh, our principal uh, cooperator in this work is Saga Robotics. It's a, it's a Norwegian company. This image shows one of the high tunnel trials in Norway, the results from Europe, uh, where they have even more severe problems with fungicide resistance and they have fewer fungicide options, have been pretty consistent. The UV treatments effectively suppress powdery mildew. And in most cases, they perform as well or better uh, than the best available fungicides. So I, I think we're beyond the point uh, where we have to worry about whether or not this technology is going to provide sustainable control of strawberry powdery mildew. Uh, it actually works quite well. The Saga robot is called Torvald. Uh, it's an interesting device that takes our basic lamp array and allows us to adapt it to a variety of crops, including uh, strawberries, grapes, uh, apples, and even hops by varying the height and width of the lamp array and the carriage. The uh, Torvald robot is fully autonomous, uh, meaning uh, that where it's allowed by law, it can actually uh, operate independently uh, without a human operator. These devices are presently largely one-off custom-built uh, units uh, right now, and they're, they're probably within a year of being commercially available either for purchase or as uh, leased units with technical support. Like everything else that's being manufactured these days during a global pandemic, uh, Saga Robotics is challenged with any number of choke points in, in their supply chains. So they're having difficulty keeping up with demand presently. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, we're in the business of discovery and one of the latest refinements in the technology has been the addition of uh, UV reflective curtains to the front and back of the lamp arrays. Now this takes a very special fabric. In fact, it's the same reflective material that's used in uh, Navy firefighter suits. Uh, it's a bit pricey, uh, but it can boost the UV dose by nearly 30%. 
and it provides even better coverage of the otherwise shaded parts of the plants under the array. Uh, that means we can go faster, and at the same time we're going faster, we're getting better coverage. And that kind of innovation in developing various mobile arrays of lamps is now occurring at several locations, both in the US and elsewhere, where mobile booms, uh, tracked units, and these autonomous uh, robotic devices are used to move lamp arrays within plant production structures, as well as in field plantings for a number of different crops. Uh, during the late winter of uh, 2019 and 2020, uh, about a month before everything hit the fan with respect to COVID-19, uh, I was in uh, the Pacific Northwest to work with Michelle at IAREC in uh, Prosser, Washington, as well as Walt Mahaffey's group in uh, Corvallis, Oregon, for uh, on designs for tractor-drawn arrays for wine grapes. Uh, and you can see how the hemi-cylindrical array has now been altered to fit something uh, closer to a grapevine canopy. In 2019, we had operational tractor-drawn units in New York treating uh, grapevines and low trellis hops. In 2020, we had two of the Torvald robotic units uh, from Saga working in vineyards in the Finger Lakes region of New York. We'll do that again this year. And we'll have robots in Oregon and in Italy this year and in California vineyards next year. Uh, showing applicability of this technology across several crops is, is really how we get the attention of equipment manufacturers. It reduces the costs of producing such units. And we make new discoveries in biology that may be relevant to many different crops, uh, different diseases and insect pests. And that, that goes especially for grapes. While these machines have a certain, uh, they have a certain cool factor, they're, they're fun to watch. Uh, it's the research on epidemiology, pathogen ecology, and photobiology research that, that really makes them work. Otherwise, it's, it's just a toy. The more diverse trials we conduct, the more we learn. Uh, you never know what you're gonna see uh, until you look. Here's one example from our grapevine work. This experiment in 2019 began with grape powdery mildew as the target, but we found that the UV treatments actually controlled a sour rot better than, than anything else we were using. Now, sour rot is a complex mess involving bacteria, fungi, and fruit feeding insects. We don't yet understand how UV is accomplishing this reduction, but the point is it was not only very effective, it was quite unexpected. Uh, we never would have thought that this, this would have had an effect. And neither did we expect that UV treatments would be effective at all against the grape downy mildew pathogen, as it, it really represents a, a challenging target. It's growing inside uh, grape leaves and fruit. But lab assays showed that pretreatment of grapevine leaves made them resistant to infection for several days afterwards. And, and this was the first time we'd seen disease suppression that was caused by UV increasing the resistance of the host to infection. Now, it's, it's one thing to see an effect like that in a lab experiment. It's not always the case that you can reproduce it in the field. Uh, in this case, though, the UV treatments also reduced the severity of downy mildew in the vineyard in 2019. And that level of suppression was comparable to that provided by a fungicide standard. Again, we don't yet know how UV is doing this. Hopefully that's gonna come later, but, and this is a big but, had we stopped in 2019, we would have been a lot happier uh, because 2020 was a far more severe year for downy mildew. And in 2020, none of the UV treatments provided acceptable suppression of the disease. The UV treatments still worked fine against powdery mildew, but they just didn't have the degree of efficacy needed to completely control downy mildew as a standard, uh, as a standalone treatment. So obviously we, we have more work to do here. Now here's another example of an unexpected effect that is immediately relevant to, uh, to many crops. Low level nighttime doses of UV effectively destroy the eggs of various mite species that attack a broad range of important plants, both in controlled environments and in field production systems. 
this suppression has been very consistent and the technique is now widely used in commercial strawberry production systems in the Netherlands, which are almost always entirely based on glasshouse uh, production. The primary effect of the UV applications is on the immature and particularly the egg stage. Uh, we're just now beginning to investigate how UV treatments affect other insect pest populations. Now, some of you may, seen, may have seen some recent research uh, reporting efficacy of ultraviolet light against botrytis or gray mold. We haven't been able to reproduce those results in our trials, either on strawberries or on grapes. That doesn't mean it can't be done. It may just indicate that we have a lot more work to do with respect to timing of the treatments, uh, dose, and interactions with environmental favorability and cultivar susceptibility. This graph shows one of the first trials we completed using weekly nighttime applications of UV to suppress powdery mildew on Chardonnay grapes in 2019. There are a lot of people now focused on this area of research, and it's the combined solution of all of these plant pathological, photobiological, and engineering issues that separate uh, a usable, effective, and safe apparatus from that that vineyard fryer that we first used in 1991. Now, I don't think UV treatments are going to be the solution to every problem. I do think we're at the stage where discoveries are occurring at a greatly accelerated pace uh, rather than once every 29 years. And as we gain uh, more experience with these trials, uh, we consistently improve the performance of UV uh, against powdery mildew to the point where it often exceeds or e at least equals the efficacy of a number of fungicide standards. Uh, these are the results from last summer uh, showing the best performing of the UV treatments against uh, great powdery mildew on Chardonnay fruit. So we're often asked how long the dark period needs to be after the UV treatment. We generally recommend uh, four hours. Four hours is optimal. In those instances where you're near the time of the summer solstice and midsummer, uh, where the nights can be quite short, our results indicate you, you could still push those treatments out to about two hours before sunrise and still get more than half of the maximum efficacy of the UV treatment. In those situations where you're pushing uh, the, the time of sunrise, we'd suggest that the last two hours of the treatment be made at a progressively higher UV dose to offset that decline in efficacy due to having less than four hours of darkness remaining. So this is a challenge, uh, but it's manageable. We're also asked questions about the possible effects of UV on fruit appearance and finish. Uh, of course, high rates of UV uh, can russet fruit as we demonstrated conclusively in 1991, uh, but we're now using less than 10% of the dose that we used in 1991 and we've yet to see an effect on, on fruit finish. So you can take a good look at these Chardonnay grapes and try to figure out uh, which ones are treated with UV and which ones are treated with a fungicide standard. We didn't find uh, any differences in berry size, finish, uh, berry number per cluster, total cluster weight uh, between the UV treated and the fungicide treated grapes. Likewise, last year, there were no differences in soluble solid levels among the UV treated versus the fungicide treated grapes. So it does appear that right now we're operating well below a level where we would uh, significantly damage the plants, uh, but at a level that actually provides pretty good control of powdery mildew. Okay, so what can we say right now with a fair degree of certainty about the uses of UV on grapevine? Well, first, we're confident we can achieve excellent suppression of powdery mildew. We've done this on several other crops now, other than grapevine, and the results from grapevine have so far been pretty consistent. Uh, the same goes for mites. It doesn't seem to matter what a mite lays its eggs on. We can kill them with UV. Next, uh, in a limited study, we've achieved uh, good suppression of sour rot, which is also good news because we don't have much else that works well uh, against this disease complex. And then there's downy mildew, where the degree of suppression seems to be dependent on the severity of a particular year. 
uh, that doesn't mean we can't use UV uh, advantageously against downy mildew. It does mean that we need to be aware of its limitations under severe disease pressure. As for botrytis, uh, we haven't seen any measurable suppression on either strawberry or grape, uh, but we haven't given up yet. Now, as for the effects of UV on the vine itself, it does appear that even at our higher doses and most frequent applications, we're operating below a level of UV that has conspicuous, uh, detectable, harmful effects on either the fruit or foliage. That's not to say that there aren't any effects that might show up later or uh, show up in the wine that's made from these grapes. That's something that's yet to be learned. In a way though, these, these conspicuous deleterious effects being absent, that, that's not really surprising because that's what we found in strawberries, cucurbits, apples, roses, tomatoes, hops, basil, and rosemary so far. In grapes, we've measured uh, some gross effects, uh, some gross responses rather on, on growth, uh, leaf length, leaf width, shoot extension, net photosynthesis, uh, stress metabolites, berry size, berry number, cluster weights, things like that, bricks levels. None of those responses indicated a harmful effect of UV, and there are obviously a number of benefits with, with respect to suppression of things that would harm the vine. So I kind of started this story with trying to describe just how many people are, are working together to move this research forward. I, I, I want to leave you knowing that this wasn't all my work. I did not do this alone. I had a lot of help from uh, some very talented people. And here they are. So uh, Laura Peterson is a former county agent in, uh, in New York and now farms 600 acres of vegetables in the area. Uh, she's on our project advisory team. Eric Seidman, uh, when he was my office mate when I was a graduate student, who knew that he would someday be the director of the National Organic Farmers Association? And there he is, he's on our project advisory committee. Arupalai Suthaparan is the PhD student who made the breakthrough discovery using the uh, UV at night rather than daytime. Arne Stensfond is a fruit pathologist from Norway. He's part of the team there, uh, the valued colleague for many years. Mariana Figuero is one of the top people working on, photo, on photobiology in the United States. If you type her name into Google and light, she fills up the first three pages. Mark Ray is the director of the Lighting Research Center at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. He's been very important in most of the work. And then there's me. The guy standing behind me is Oli Mirna. He's a Norwegian strawberry grower, mechanical engineer, and inventor. He's also on our project advisory team. Rebecca Seidman married Eric, but she's also a professor of sustainable agriculture at the University of New Hampshire. She's on the project advisory team. Robert Seam is an epidemiologist uh, at Cornell University, one of the principal investigators on the work and also my former supervisor. Natalia Perez is a professor at the University of Florida and has led most of the work on strawberry. Her graduate student uh, underneath the array working on his suntan is uh, Rodrigo Onofre. He's now a postdoc at Kansas State University. He was instrumental in doing most of the work on strawberry and powdery mildew. Lance Cadle Davidson is a research geneticist and grape breeder at uh, our station here working with USDA. He's my partner in crime in most of these studies that require expertise in molecular biology. Jan Nyrop is our director of the experiment station at Cornell, but he's also a very talented entomologist and leads the work on mites and UV. And then there's Walt Mahaffey and Michelle, our colleagues, uh, valued colleagues working on the left side of the country in the investigation. So my principal role is, uh, is really just to get you interested in this kind of weird mix of, of biology and epidemiology and technology. Uh, I want you to stay interested in it. Uh, I wanted to get you to ask some questions about it. So when we get to the period for questions, uh, we'll see how well I've done. Uh, if you've made it this far, you've been a very patient and attentive audience, and I look forward to answering any questions uh, you might have. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you, David. So uh, yes, there are some questions already. Um, so the first is, what will the likely maintenance requirements be for a unit using the technology? For example, 
a typical fungicide tractor might run for maybe 750 hours per season. Mm -hmm. So the bulb lives are measured in thousands of hours and duty cycles. We have units that we've been using for three seasons where we have not had to replace a lamp, a ballast, or any part of the electronics. As for the robotic devices, I really don't know. Uh, we have used one all last season, and we started using it this season uh, without breakdowns. That's a good question. I would look at the warranty that's offered by the manufacturers. So far, these are custom built units. Uh, the autonomous robotic devices are actually manufactured though. Yeah, okay. And you mentioned best application is finished four hours before dawn, but is there a best time after dusk? Really what you wanna do is wait till the sun is below the horizon and then count off about another 30 minutes. It's called civil twilight. Once you've reached the end of that, uh, it's dark enough that there is no interference from what little stray blue light might be actually still present. Okay. So half an hour after sunset. Okay. Um, will the power requirements allow for multi-row units? Absolutely. Uh, so even, even smog, which has close to 155 watt lamps, is, is running off a relatively small generator. Okay. Uh, let's see. So you talked about the DNA damages. Whoops, they're coming in and moving my, <laughs> my screen here. Uh, okay, you talked about the DNA damages on pathogens to explain the effects of the UV. In France, the society UV boosting developed UV light treatment in vines. Talks about activation of plant defense by an effect on the jasmonic and salicylic pathway. Mm -hmm. You notice this kind of effect or do you think that it is also, the effect is only effective on the pathogen and not the vines? The plants do respond. I mean, you will see upregulation of uh, phenolic synthesis in the vines, uh, but the primary effect with respect to powdery mildew is directly upon the pathogen. When we separate uh, the pathogen from the plant, and you can really only do that with the spores of the pathogen, you see the exact same degree of kill off the plant that you do on. So it's these compounds do function in defense against some pathogens. They may indeed function uh, against powdery mildews, uh, but the doses of UV that we're using are more than enough to kill the pathogen on the surface of the plant without involving host defense. Okay. It's, it, it may be that these are functioning against downy mildew Yeah. because we're seeing we're seeing suppression of downy mildew when the plants are treated with UV before the pathogen arrives. And that has to be due to altered uh, uh, plant susceptibility. So is there any benefit in treating in the off season when there's no foliar growth, uh, you know, like diseases that can overwinter? And then what about decreasing the amount that stay, can stay in buds rather than just the leaf and grape bunches? And it's, then that would another question after that. That would be a tough target. Uh, for one thing, of all of the structures that are produced by powdery mildews, it's only the overwintering structures, the cleistothesia, that would be on the bark of the vine that contain melanin and thick cell walls, and those cells are dead. So getting UV to the living tissues inside of these overwintering structures is going to be very difficult. It's going to require very high doses and very high intensity. I don't think that's likely. Likewise, getting UV into a bud is going to be nearly impossible. Yeah. So no, I, I don't think it will. It, it, of all the, uh, it has all of the characteristics of a bad and difficult target. Yeah. And then uh, what would, do you know the approximate cost of this treatment versus spray regimes, the sort of cost effectiveness? It's entirely dependent upon how you value your own time. Uh, the materials to build uh, a single row unit is a couple thousand dollars. Uh, the lamps are not expensive. <laughs> They're hard to find right now during a, a pandemic, uh, but the lamps cost about $10 a piece. A ballast can run two lamps and the ballast is about $30. So you have to build a carriage and put wheels on it. Uh, but you could probably build one of these towable arrays for less than $5,000 if you did the fabrication yourself. Okay. 
And what type of insect pests have you found success in controlling? So but far, just mites. Only mites so far? Just mites so far. We've okay. irritated thrips, which made me feel good. <laughs> we irritated leaf hoppers, but they came back the next day a little right. very angry with it. Yeah. And that's one of the things that the Wine Commission is actually funding as a part of Lexi's project is we're going to be looking at mealybug, early season mealybug crawler suppression. Mm -hmm. the, the problem with insects is they don't sit still like fungi do. So they're much more challenging to get mortality data on because they don't die right away, especially the adults. So if it's a pest where a benefit is received by killing them the day after they're exposed, uh, then that's great. But in the case of a leafhopper, where the injury can be inflicted in a transient fashion, and then the, the, the leafhopper is going to leave the area, uh, then, then irradiating them and killing them after the damage is done, that, that's just revenge. Um, are the commercial UV units drawn by a tractor, or do they have their own engine? If the latter, are they autonomous? There are no tractor-drawn units that I know of that are commercially available. These are all built by, um, by our collaborators. Okay. We, we do produce designs for the arrays. But you're right at the cusp of really commercial manufacture yet. We don't want to build things. Right. <laughs> we want, if, if we could run a business without a subsidy, uh, we wouldn't be scientists. Okay. Now here's a couple more. Are there any fight phytotoxicity issues that would need to be considered more than we do now if this was used in a hybrid chemical slash UVC regime? Can you envision, you know, maybe it could have a dual? I, I do think that uh, eventually we will get to some kind of an integrated program where uh, chemicals are used in conjunction with UV. As I said, these, these are used uh, primarily to date on high value crops uh, with multiple pest systems. So it's, it's not going to be something where UV controls everything. Uh, right. But in an area like the Western United States where powdery mildews really, uh, you know, your, your other options for controlling uh, pests and diseases would be so much easier if powdery mildew was out of the picture. Mm -hmm. and, right. and I think UV has the potential to do that. And so maybe can I follow up with, with Richard's question there? Sure. So Walt Mahaffey, his trials down in Cal or in Oregon are doing that. He's using a hybrid system where he's essentially doing one spray a week with sulfur and then the next other treatment is with UV and with various intervals. So he's, he's working on that with sulfur. Ours up here is a hybrid system, but not within a spray program. It's splitting up the season. So it's UV, UV, and then we switch to a, a chemical treatment. But Richard, to follow up with that, we do have to treat our entire vineyard with insecticides, right? So we do whole vineyard treatments and then a day, but we usually do then the day after our UVC treatments. So that way we don't necessarily have that direct overlap where there might be extremely high levels of chemical residue on the leaf while we're using the UVC treatment. So that's just one thing we've done to, obviously it's a good test question, but to potentially avoid that for this trial, we do the UVC mm -hmm. treatments and then follow up with yeah. a alternative spray second. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this is a this is a strategy that we've employed successfully also in strawberries, mm -hmm. okay. where where powdery mildew is a serious problem, but it's certainly not the only problem. Right. And David, could you see this maybe being used after rain events to protect pruning wounds from eutypa or other dead arm, or are we going to get back into the, the the cell tissue, the living living tissue? I don't think you're going to damage. Um, you know, cambial tissue around a pruning cut with UV. So this is a really good technology for attacking single cell microorganisms uh, at night. Uh, multicellular organisms are harder to kill. That's why we have trouble killing uh, adult insects. They have a thick in integument. Um, it's difficult to drive UV through that. Shortwave UV doesn't penetrate tissues very well. In fact, it has difficulty getting through the waxy cuticle of plants. So that is a benefit, actually, when you're trying to kill a powdery mildew, because the difference between what will harm the plant and what will harm the pathogen is quite large. So I don't, th I don't know if uh, this would be effective in uh, a therapy for pruning wounds to prevent eutypa, but I do think it's not likely to damage the tissues around the pruning wound.
not the plant tissues. Yeah. So Richard, I think the problem there too is, you know, when we say if it rains after pruning wounds, you know, that's when you type is releasing spores. The problem is we don't actually know how long after the rain you type starts to release spores. And so the question is, is like, would you go out and do the UVC treatment but even before you type it releases spores? So then it, it's going to provide absolutely no protective activity. It's purely an eradicant technology in that situation. So you're the timing. If we had better idea of when you type was actually infecting uh, the plant, both time of year, because that's, I still, I don't think is very well um, understood in Washington and then time after the rain event, then probably, but I, I think yeah. that's a lot more just basic type of biology that needs to be figured out there. Yeah. yeah. In, in our area, the other thing I, I didn't think of until just now is we're doing our pruning in midwinter and fluorescent, uh, these low pressure discharge UV lamps are sensitive to temperature. Uh, like a, a household fluorescent lamp, it doesn't perform very well in a cold environment. Okay, well, that will affect us too. <laughs> so uh, can both of you maybe touch on the safety, worker safety and exposure? Um, you know, and are there standards that have been set yet or are we still uh, in that area where they will be developing? Yeah, so these lamps look like fluorescent lamps. They're not truly fluorescent. At, at their heart, all true fluorescent lamps actually produce shortwave UVC inside but they're coated with a, a phosphorus compound that fluoresces and gives off uh, visible light. If you take away that coating on the inside of the tube and just have a clear uh, glass tube that transmits UV, it's, it's a low pressure discharge lamp and it produces only UVC. These lamps have been around for 75 years. They're in a lot of applications. So the health uh, and safety standards are very well established. These are used widely in hospitals, operating rooms, air purification, water purification. They have a lot of industrial uses. So yes, there are worker safety standards. And in the cases of the units that are used in agriculture, the PPE that's required is very similar to what you would use for pesticide application. So opaque clothing, no exposed skin, and eye protection are the the most essential things. You, you do not want to have exposed skin around these lamps, even for a few seconds. And that's why the, the arrays that you see have those uh, plastic curtains at each end, uh, those actually block UV. So we do have uh, safety pamphlets that we give out to anyone who's involved in these applications. Okay. I think we've answered all the questions. Uh, yeah, let me check. Yes. Uh, anything you might want to add, either one, that we for you forgot to mention? Yes, if you're really concerned about the effects of uh, ultraviolet light on uh, wine quality, epiphytic microflora, and uh, quality parameters, you should keep an eye on what Michelle's doing. Okay. So she's I, the she's the expert in that area. So Dave, there is there is a question on you because you and I have talked a little bit about this about using LED UV lights. Somebody wants to know mm -hmm. about using LEDs because for the less requirement of, for power and you know pretty yep. functional. Well, they they won't work as well, but at least they'll cost you more. Oh. No, it's a, a serious answer would be there. Um, present technology for uh, UV LEDs is is really underdeveloped. Uh, they're very expensive and they're very low powered. So right now we have almost the ideal tool. We have a 75 year old technology that is really cheap and extremely powerful. Uh, so for an LED to match that, the LEDs are gonna have to start putting out, instead of milliwatts, they're gonna have to put out 50 watts, 100 watts. And, and they just can't do that right now. The materials that LEDs are constructed of are very sensitive to UV, so they, they essentially self-destruct. And they're frightfully expensive. Yeah. So David, in your work with the grapes on the East Coast, you haven't followed it through the winemaking life cycle. We have right. not. Okay. We, we would like to do that. Uh, but right now we're at the stage where we're we're really looking at efficacy against the diseases and as many different pests as we can suppress with them. Uh, we have not yet made wine with any of the grapes. 
uh, we've looked at some of the basic kind of crude measures of, of uh, whether it's harming the plant, uh, and we haven't seen any indication of harm. But no, we have not yet made wine. And that is part of Michelle's project. Uh, no, we're fruit oh. sensory. Yeah, we're doing oh, fruit, fruit sensory. sensory. Yeah, so one, up, up one to step. the fruit pad, up to the, and, and a whole suite of uh, much much more in-depth chemical analysis on the fruit. So tannins, phenolics, flavonoids. I mean, we're really kind of digging into some of those other components and then doing the fruit sensory, but we're not, not moving into the winemaking aspect until we can get a good disease control management out here. Um, and, and, you know, there's there's challenges with, with research level winemaking as well. So I think I'll probably... Once we perfect things on our end, we will turn it over to the right. industry to tell that's, me how, that's how exactly <laughs> that's exactly what I would do. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll take it one step at a time. Does it work? If it works, does it cause harm? If it doesn't cause harm, what's it do to the wine? Right, right. So, so it sounds like we still have uh, several years of research in front of us, but uh, I'm it's job security. I to, and if you're driving by the station on Monday nights or Thursday nights between 9 p.m. and midnight, you might see the thing glowing out in our vineyard here. <laughs> oh, great. So uh, with that, we're just a few minutes after four, so we will uh, wrap this up. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And as I mentioned, we will send out the recording link to all those who registered, uh, and it will be posted on the Wine Commission's website. Thank you, Melissa. So with that, thank you very much, Michelle and David. Thank you all. Everybody. It's five o'clock where David's at. So I think it's yeah. five everywhere. seven o'clock <laughs> past five. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's after five somewhere. It's after five somewhere. Right. All right. Thanks everybody. Okay. Thank you. Bye, Bye, Bye everyone.